All right, welcome back again, everyone, for another episode of The Daily Show by Discovery Day Program. This episode is for October 5. And yes, we are in uh, the month of October now, guys. As usual, I just want to uh, check up on you. How are you doing? I hope you are having a great time today. Or if you're just, again, starting your day, I hope you're looking forward to a uh, an awesome day ahead of you. As for me... Well, I'm just excited to uh, share you some of the uh, the things that we'll talk about again today, as usual. Um, so for today, we'll talk about teachers. We'll talk about uh, doing something nice. Uh, two different observances, uh, but the second one I always uh, for the, for that second one I did mention I always wanted to showcase observances that promote positivity and again uh, we have another one today so that's pretty awesome and then another i guess another positive thing or another good thing that we'll talk about uh today apple betty i don't know if you guys tried an apple betty before i'm thinking if i've tried an apple betty before so i may i may i may have i may have i just can't remember when and where and then for today in history We'll talk about the first ever presidential speech on TV. And then we'll travel to Guatemala for their, our uh, place of the week and talk about their national symbols. And as usual, we we'll just stay uh, stay, tuned. <laughs> stay tuned for the stuff of the day. All right, with that said, let's go ahead. So first up on the list, I did mention a while ago, um, teachers about teachers it's world teachers day now if you uh, remember back on May I, I uh, somewhere back in May <laughs> I, I, I remember that we had an observance related to teachers back on May it was the National Teachers Day but this time though it's celebration for all teachers around the world it's world teachers day it's not just local here in the US so it commemorates the anniversary of the adoption of the 1966 ILO UNESCO recommendation uh, concerning the status of teachers, which sets benchmarks regarding the rights and responsibilities of teachers and standards for their initial preparation and further education, uh, recruitment, recruitment, employment, and teaching and learning conditions. The uh, recommendation concerning the status of higher education teaching personnel was adopted in 1997 to complement the 1966 recommendation by covering teaching uh, personnel in higher education. Then uh, this observance, World Teachers Day, has been celebrated since 1994. Um, so I, I guess compared to other observances, this one's pretty recent, just you know, 1994. Okay, um, Back on May, I did mention uh, the fact that being a teacher is not as easy as many mo people might think. You know, it's not just all about going to the classroom and start writing on the board uh, and then ask the students to, to, uh, to read the book and then you ask questions in the end. Um, for me, it shouldn't be just like that, you know. Um, a, a, a teacher uh, or an awesome teacher for me it will will take responsibility um, for teaching accurate information and knowledge so what it means uh, what I'm trying to say I guess is like if there's any misinformation that a teacher have shared uh, to their students you know um, and they realize it was wrong you know as a as a teacher one should feel uh, responsible uh, by correcting it right away that hey oh by the way uh, this is what I taught before um, but uh, there was actually uh, that was actually inaccurate so so uh, you know this is the act the, the correct information so something like that uh, I consider that being a good um, one one good character of a, uh, a good teacher you know not just now yeah, I want to get a paycheck or something you know um, speaking of teachers uh, or speaking of good teachers, there's a lot. There are a lot of uh, unheard teachers who basically, like you know, go aside aside from um, being passionate 
Um, they even go above and beyond. You know, they, they even go an extra mile um, to be able to to teach other children who doesn't have um, access to uh, to education. You know, especially in developing countries. Um, the reason why I'm saying this is because I, I saw uh, a news. You know, I, I saw. Uh, a news. Well, it's in our country. Yeah, in our our country is still considered to be developing country. You know. So, anyways, I've seen this news um, about a couple of teachers. I would say like two, three, if I remember it correctly. So they traveled by foot uh, to a very remote region where there is no vehicle access. Um, it would take them hours to reach the building. Um, so I think it's it's kind of like uh, how do I say? It? It's kind of like news, but also documentary style or something, you know? Um, but anyways, so they will travel by foot to a very remote region uh, because the way to go there, you know, vehicle, the vehicle access is not, you know, it is just not possible. So they, they, they will have to walk and then it will take them hours to reach the building that will serve as a school. Then when they arrive, they would stay there for for weeks or sometimes even months uh, by making the same building that was supposed to be the school, you know, that building, their home. I mean, you know, they're 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 that's where they're gonna stay. Basically, they're not gonna stay in the house. They're gonna stay in the actual building that is uh, supposed to be the school. You know, so that means they don't have any rooms. They will just uh, set up their their uh, things on the floor. You know, that's where they're gonna lay down. There were no beds, so, um, so, yeah. I, I guess if you uh, if you hear that, it's like, well, it's kind of like camping. It's true. That's true. Uh, it could be. <laughs> I mean, it's quite an adventure. But what is what is for me? What is mind blowing in that story is that those two, three teachers who uh, ha you know, who kind of did what they had to do. Uh, they did it for 10 children, you know, for just 10 children. They did it for just 10 children. So, um, imagine as, as, as that, as someone who don't really be, you know, they, they don't really get compensated enough for that effort right there. So that's kind of like the sad part too, but that didn't stop them from, uh, from, from deciding to share knowledge or to educate these 10 children who who unfortunately lives in a remote uh, region um, and and that's amazing I mean for me that is amazing that is pretty uh, I mean you, you get you have these responsible teachers you have the, these passionate teachers but and then you have these teachers so actually go way above their or outside their comfort zone just for the sake of of uh, educating other children who don't have unfortunately don't have the uh the ability or the capacity to go to a regular school so that is pretty amazing for me so that is what it means to be an awesome teacher well i mean i'm not saying you you're supposed to like travel to the wilderness and and do the same thing i'm, I'm just sharing you know uh i'm sure they're not the only ones who are doing it. I'm sure in other countries, and especially the uh, developing countries, um, they have their fair share of these awesomeness of, of teachers uh, for them. I, I did just share what I saw in one of our uh, news outlet. So, yeah. And of course, if there are awesome teachers, uh, well, of course, there's, there's uh, also gonna be the not so awesome, you know, like those quote unquote teachers uh who are pretty much just around to get their paycheck you know the, the one that i just said a while ago so uh, uh i don't know it's 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 quite sad for me because you know the teachers who are really good and passionate about educating people and and uh and uh sharing their knowledge you know to the students they're getting tainted the same as as those who don't who don't care you know so that, that and then that's why if I hear some people would say, well, you know, th these teachers, they don't really, they're not really struggling and all, you know, that's not true. Every profession uh, has has uh, some level of challenge. So, yeah. Anyways, uh, for this day, 
you get a uh, second time appreciating your favorite teacher and acknowledging their hard work in order to pass their knowledge and to get you educated you know and of course the uh the, our first teachers should be our parents if ever uh they're the ones who uh teach us uh the the basics <laughs> before we go to the actual school so yeah all right next up we got do something nice day hold on one second let me let me just okay i i thought i wasn't recording i thought i forgot to press record but no we're good <laughs> we're good i'm like i've been talking for about 10 minutes here already and uh if it wasn't recorded ah i have to start over again but no we're good i guess anyways do something nice day so yesterday uh it, it's not my episode it's liz but she may have introduced the observance called international toot your own flute day yeah just in case she mentioned that uh if not then that observance is supposed to be for yesterday uh where you spend the day just thinking and just focusing about yourself uh, today though is a day to be selfless it's it's the opposite of the uh of, of the, this observance the uh, international to your own flute day today the do something nice um or do something nice day is the opposite of that where you're going to not think about yourself or not focus about yourself focus on yourself but to other people there you go so you should put your thoughts into actions by doing something nice for other people the most important thing though is whatever you do should be done not because it will evoke a positive response from someone else but mainly because you're doing it from the bottom of your heart there you go um, you don't want to do something that you feel obligated or forced to you know so often we go through our days in a hurry and uh, don't think about the effect on other or, or, I mean on other people or someone else that stopping and pausing to do something nice will have today is a day to set a foundation of kindness and hopefully we'll stay long after this day has passed you know it's even gonna be better if this is more of a, an everyday thing or an every, everyday habit now again doing something nice for someone it shouldn't be up uh, you shouldn't feel obligated um and we're not actually talking about something big where uh, oh yeah uh, i can i can uh, drive someone to their work or oh i can uh, i can buy someone lunch it, it, that's at level i mean you could even like start at to um start from as as simple as greeting everyone good morning because you know maybe someone woke up not having a good day your uh greetings might change their mood for the whole day that is nice that is nice that, i mean the person will find you nice for that so little things count too it doesn't need to be like something big or something fancy you know just a just a reminder okay so uh for this observance challenge yourself before the end of the day if uh you can do something nice for other people your friends family members uh your staff uh, if you're, you know, if, if you have any staff at home assisting you, um, what else? I wouldn't really recommend strangers, <laughs> you know, especially around this time. Um, but if someone needs help, uh, maybe you can help out, you know. So again, just a reminder, uh, you gotta do something nice to others, not to yourself. Because if you say, well, I'm gonna celebrate this observance, do something nice day, and I will do something nice for myself. <laughs> no, that I just cleared it a while ago. It's actually the opposite of that. Doing something nice for other people, okay? For other people. And then, third observance we'll talk about today, something nice. Apple Betty, Apple Betty Day right there, or Apple Brown Betty. So this observance is for this, for, for, for this amazing dessert. I consider this a dessert, yeah. Do you guys consider this as, as a, a, a dessert? I hope you do, but okay, so Apple Betty or Apple Brown Betty is similar to an apple pie, but has butter and sweetened crumbs instead of crust. Bettys may also be made with other fruits such as berries or pears, 
and uh, their main seasonings are sugar, cinnamon, and nutmeg. Um, they are often topped with a lemon sauce or whipped cream. Uh, the apple betty is American, is American as apple pie, having been eaten during colonial times, uh, which was mentioned in print in somewhere in 1864. Wow! And eaten by Ronald and Nancy Reagan uh, while they were in, in the White House, being one of their favorite desserts. Oh yeah! Well. <laughs> I don't know why I had to uh, justify that this thing is a dessert, you know. Well, the reason why I'm saying it is because sometimes if the food is really good, you kind of forget about the uh, the serving size, you know. Um, so that's a good reason to emphasize it's a dessert because if it's a dessert, it's pretty. It's not a meal. It's something you would take after the meal. So it should be taken uh, into a tiny serving. There you go. And remember, this uh, this has like a lot of sugar too. So, another reason not to finish the whole pie, you know, or Betty. <laughs> We're talking about Betty. So, if your diet allows, as usual, why not get a bite of this wonderful dessert? Um, we don't have any other notable observances we'll mention for this episode. So, we're gonna jump uh, straight to today in history. Here we go, 1947, Harry, President Harry Truman um, makes the first ever televised presidential address uh, from the White House, asking Americans to cut back on their use of grain in order to help starving Europeans. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so at that time of Truman's food conservation speech, Europe was still recovering from World War II and suffering from famine. Um, Mr. Truman, the uh, 33rd Commander-in-Chief, worried that if the U.S. didn't provide food aid, his administration's Marshall Plan for European eco economic recovery would fall apart. He asked farmers and distillers to reduce grain use and requested to, that the public voluntarily forgo meat on Tuesdays, eggs and poultry on Thursdays, and uh, save a slice of bread each day. Uh, the food program was short-lived as ultimately the Marshall Plan succeeded in helping to spur economic revi- uh, revi- uh, I can't pronounce that word. Let me try it again. Revitalization. <laughs> Revitalization. There you go. And growth in Europe. Oh man. I'm still, you know, I'm still struggling in a lot of words in English. Well, to be fair, it's not my, uh, what do you call it? It's not my my first language, you know. Anyways, in 1947, uh, television was still very new and the number of TVs or TV sets in the US homes um, only numbered in the thousands, you know. Um, by the early 1950s, however, millions of Americans owned TVs. Most people listened to the radio for news and entertainment. However, although the majority of Americans missed Truman's TV debut, his speech signaled the start of a powerful and complex relationship between the White House and a medium that would have enormous impact on the American presidency. From now, or from how candidates campaigned for the office to how presidents communicated with their constituents, or even how they got elected. So there you go. And you know, just the invention of uh, television definitely changed the. Uh, the form of communication, not just in here in the U.S., but all around the world. That's for sure, you know? Um, we have one more, by the way, for Today in History, 1919. Young Italian car mechanic and engineer named Enzo Ferrari, or Enzo Ferrari, <laughs> if, the, uh, if I would go with the, I don't know, American accent. Well, I do have a different accent, that's for sure, you know? <laughs> Anyways, Enzo Ferrari takes part in his first car race. Uh, a hill climb in Parma, Italy. He finished fourth. Uh, Ferrari was a good driver, but not a great one. In all, he won just 13 of the 47 races he entered. Many people say that this is because he cared too much for the sports car he drove. He could never bring himself to ruin an engine in order to win a race. In the mid-1920s, Ferrari retired from racing cars in order to pursue his first love, uh, building them. Um, he took over the Alfa, Rome uh, Alfa Romeo racing department in 1929 
and began to turn out cars under his own name. Um, annoyed with Ferrari's heavy-handed management style, Alfa Romeo fired him in 1939. After that, he started his own manufacturing firm, but he spent the the war or the war years building machine tools instead of uh, race cars. Then in 1947, um, the first real Ferraris appeared on the market. Finally, you know, the same year Ferrari won the Rome Grand Prix, um, his first race as an independent car maker. Then in 1949, two years after that, Ferrari won um, the Le Mans Road Race for the first time. And in 1952, one of the team's driver, Alberto Ascari, uh, became the world racing champion. He won every race he entered that year. So it's quite, I would say, an inspiring story of that, that tells you not to give up in life. You know, early on, it's going to be tough, um, but you'll eventually, you'll eventually uh, get the, the success that, you, uh, that you've been looking for. As long as you pursue your dream, as long as you're uh, passionate about uh, what you're doing, then yes. Like being, you know, like teaching kids for our um, World Teachers Day. I almost said National Teachers. World Teachers Day. There you go. So, some of the notable figures born today we have. First, Chester Arthur. Chester A. Arthur in 1829. So, the 21st president of the United States. Um, prior to becoming president, Mr. Arthur had a long involvement with New York Republican politics and became James Garfield's uh, vice presidential nominee to balance the ticket. After a uh, year and a half, he became president after Garfield was assassinated. Um, Arthur's one-term presidency is mainly remember um, for his advocacy to civil of civil service or civil service reform. Uh, this took shape of the Pendleton Civil Service Reform Act, which he strongly enforced and which became the centerpiece of his administration. In military matters, he oversaw the rebirth of the U.S. Navy. By the time of the 1884 presidential election, he had already decided against a second term, but put up a token effort for the nomination rather than drop out. In any case, the Republicans lost the election and Arthur was succeeded by Democrat candidate Grover Cleveland. So, uh, though he was widely praised in his time for his reforms, um, Arthur's pre presence largely faded from popular memory over time. Um, we have another one, Robert H. Goddard. So he's an American rock pi rock pioneer. <laughs> Rocket Pioneer, there we go. Not a, not, not a rock band or anything, Rocket. But, uh, sorry about that. But yeah, he's an American Rocket Pioneer, best known as the founding father of modern rocketry, and built the world's first liquid-fueled rocket, which was successfully launched in 1926. And then we got Kate Winslet, 1975. Um, the youngest person to acquire six Academy Award nominations, including the 2008 Academy Award for, he for Best Actress, for which she won for her role in The Reader. Uh, one of the few actresses also, or she, is also one of the few actresses to have won three of the four major American Entertainment Awards with her Oscar, Emmy, and Grammy. There you go. And of course, who would, you know, who would forget about her role as Rose in, come on, Titanic, right? Uh, together with Leo. Leo DiCaprio. Alright, we're going to Guatemala. So, place of the week. Um, national animal. Let's start, about, let's start with that. Quetzal, a long-tailed green and blue member of the Trogon family. Not only is the uh, Quetzal the national bird of Guatemala, but it also lends its name to the country's currency and appears on its flag. Um, <clears throat> the Quetzal is also one of the spirit guides of the Maya. Um, in case you're wondering why Quetzal has been recognized as the uh, national animal or national bird 
of Guatemala. Um, it is said that the warrior prince Tecun Uman, the last ruler of the Quiche Maya uh, during the Spanish conquest, had one of the birds as his spirit guide. Uh, legend has it that when he died or when he passed away, the bird swooped down and landed on his body, leaving it with distinctive red feathers on its chest. And then we also have the Mona Blanca, um, national flower of Guatemala. Uh, one of the uh, one of the orchids that grow in Guatemala is this. Um, aside from uh, the Mona Blanca, it's also called the White Nun, White Nun orchid. Um, looking closely at the center of the flower, you'll understand where this uh, white orchid gets its name. In the center of the flower, uh, you're gonna see they are joined together right there. Wait, am I looking at the right picture? Well, I'm looking over here, but I think I'm looking somewhere else in the whole picture of the video. I'm looking at my monitor right now. Yeah, so you can see that they are joined together that bear a resemblance of a nun bent in prayer. There you go. The Mona Blanca is mainly found in the northwest region of Guatemala. And then the uh, one of the oldest game, uh, traditional game in uh, Guatemala and one of the oldest in pretty much like the Central American culture, uh, Ulama, right there. So Ulama is a ball game based on the ancient Mayan sport that is still played today. Evidence indicates that the uh, that other Central American cultures also play this game. Um, the objective of this game is to keep the ball in play within the four lines of play. Uh, generally, five or more players from each team play, uh, or from each team, play and points are awarded when one of the players fail or fla fails and sends the ball out of the game area. In this game, it is only allowed to hit the ball with a whip. Or I did say whip, but no, not whip. Whip are uh, there are no whips there, but hip. There you go. Your hip, yeah. Uh, the rules indicate that the team wins by uh, first scoring eight points. So it's kind of like a race to eight points. Now, if you look closely at those two circles and the walls, if you've seen the the animated film The Road to El Dorado, they actually played it there. So in case you wanted to see how it's being played. Uh, well, of course, in, in, in that animated film, uh, it's comical, so it's kind of like not the actual way you play it, or not exactly how you play it, but the the idea on how to play this game it, is there, if you've seen that uh, movie, animated movie. Um, again, The Road to El Dorado. So, if you haven't, check it out. It's, it, it's a good movie. It's funny too. <laughs> Alright, that's it for our, uh, what do you call this? For our uh, place of the week, we're moving on to stuff of the day, and we're gonna talk about Stitch. <laughs> yes, I know Stitch is an alien, okay, but he's still based uh, based from an animal here on the earth. When uh, when the artist uh, or the artists are trying to conceptualize what Stitch will look like, so um, also known as Experiment Six Two Six. Stitch is a genetic experiment created by Jumba Jukiba, or Jumba Jukiba, uh, whose pri primary function is to destroy everything he touches. And boy, he actually does. <laughs> I remember the movie. Um, after escaping the lawful galactic armada, uh, Stitch landed or crash landed on Earth on the Hawaiian island of Kauai. Did I pronounce that right? I think it's Kauai. Yeah where he meets a lonely girl named Lilo. There you go. Um, I, again, though Stitch is an alien, we can't deny how Stitch greatly resembles an animal called the koala. I mean, come on, here you go. You don't believe me? Well, check this out. The only d main difference is the, the fur color, the skin color, right? So, we're gonna be talking about koalas. The koala is a small, fur a flurry, furry animal. Oh man, I've been... I've been mispronouncing words here and there today, huh? But again, I do apologize for that. Uh, going back, the koala is a small furry animal of Eastern Australia. Uh, yes, not in Hawaii, <laughs> even though Stitch is in Hawaii. Um, 
It's sometimes called a bear, like a koala bear, you know, because it kind of looks like a living teddy bear. Um, but the koala is not really a bear, no. <laughs> it belongs to the group of animals called marsupials. Um, so marsup marsupials are those animals that carry their young in a pouch, like a, imagine a kangaroo. There you go. So uh, koala, koalas are closely related to, or related closer to kangaroos, not bear, because they don't really have anything to do with being a bear, you know. Um, instead of having a blue or blue skin or fur like, uh, like stitch, the koala has a sturdy body with pale gray to yellowish fur. It is about 24 to 33 inches long. It has small yellow eyes, a round black leathery nose, and a big fluffy ears. There you go. I mean, it's still a fluffy animal, you know, because of the fluffy ears. Not flurry, I did say flurry a while ago. Um, there's a little bit of a uh, not so good thing about koala. Not, not for the koala, but the fact that the koala before was once hunted by millions for for its fur you know uh the good thing however is that the government passed laws to protect it to protect the koalas now so uh still uh koalas are still uh threatened by disease or diseases and by the loss of the of its natural habitat so let's be mindful for our friends stitch or uh experiment 626 i'm kidding just koalas Plan of the day, we got coral bells. Um, coral bells, a long favorite species of for gardens, has also become a favorite container plant. These perennials plant or perennial plants come in a range of colors and leaf textures. Coral bells is a mounting plant, and it looks great on its own, or paired with contrasting plants, or with plants that offer varying shades of the same color there you go all right so uh for, for is this uh, yeah this is my first october episode i'm trying to just make sure because i didn't tell you guys this from last week um uh, we're gonna go rick rolling today or at least for the whole month we're gonna be talking about rick astley um so you should you should have heard of him at least he's got like two uh he, his two most iconic songs will be never gonna give you up and together forever um granted he's got actually more songs than that but because of the uh the the meme the internet meme that happened uh, i think back in 2007 or 2008 uh th that's the reason behind the the song never gonna give you up being so being so famous so um yeah and again you probably don't know but he's got other songs and for the whole month here's what we're gonna do we're gonna talk about his uh, like recent songs we're not gonna go to the 1980s uh, even well he's got songs back in the 1980s too right but he's mainly remembered for his 1980s song so instead of uh going at, around that decade we're gonna go to his uh recent ones uh like for for this one for example the the first one that we have right here 2016 yes he's still singing up until now he's making singles he's making songs up until now um today uh we have keep singing that's the title uh, it was released as a digital download in the united kingdom on april 6 of 2016 as the lead single from his seventh studio album 50. Um, the song peaked at number 127 on the UK singles chart, singles chart, and also charted in Belgium. The song was written and produced by Astley, and is performed in the key of B flat minor. If you're a musician, you know you want to know which uh, key Rick Astley uh, sang his song, B minor or B flat minor, right there. Um, in an interview. Rick Astley stated that this song reflects a story about his life. So, there you go. Now, word of the day, we have... It's October, so 10-letter word. We're gonna go with appreciate. So, let me go ahead and spell it for you guys for now. A-P-P-R-E-C-I-A-T. 
T E. Appreciate. It's a verb and it means to understand the worth or importance of something or someone. To admire and value something or someone. There you go. Appreciate. You know, it could be a person. You appreciate a person. It could be an object, an item. You appreciate it. You, uh, you, you, you value the worth or importance of that something. And it could also be a gesture. You know, a being nice to uh, uh, someone. That someone will appreciate you. So, what are you waiting for? Do the uh, do something nice day today. Wait, no. Well, not right now, but I guess after the episode. <laughs> and lastly, our tech trivia for today. Did you guys know the very first mobile phone? And that is what the first mov mobile phone looks like. <laughs> I said mobile with <laughs> letter V. Oh, man. But yeah, that's... That's the first mobile phone. See what the uh, the the person is holding right there. No screens, just button buttons and speaker and that very long antenna right there. Yes. Did you guys know that time it cost four thousand dollars? Four thousand dollars. All right. All right. That is crazy to realize, you know. And again, I always tell you guys this but technology some if it's new it's it's bound to be expensive um until the rest of the world catch up then the production uh becomes more more uh how do you more uh, accessible you know or the production uh, becomes more common so the uh the, the value or uh the price will go down but anything that's first in the world of technology it's gonna be bound to be expensive just saying. So anyways, it was from Motorola. Motorola released the world's first mobile phone. Uh, it's called the, the DynaTAC, T-A-C, not T-E-C-H. DynaTAC 8000X. And this phone was released in 1983. So, I mean... <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm not used to seeing, uh, you know, a mobile phone like that now. When you say mobile phone, uh, at this point in time, it's this. It's right here. Screen. Less button. Very small. Very sleek. Well, it's not very, but, uh, you know, compared to that, that one looks like you, you use it to shave eyes. I'm just saying. Okay, so this one. Portable. Uh, mobile phone. You know, it says $4,000, but if we're going to go technical, it's... 3,995 <laughs> there you go upon release so it's what five dollars short yeah okay uh it offered 30 minutes of talk time charging the device required 10 hours oh wow that was uh that's that sounds crazy you know well again compared to what we have now um uh, smartphones or mobile phones supposed to be last supposed to last you for a day generally you know and then charge you or lets you charge the phone to to full uh full level or a hundred percent would be like what uh, an hour at most now you know but this one is it, this one is kind of like how do you say it? like it's inverted it's inverted there's only 30 minutes of talk time um but you have to charge it for 10 hours wow Look how far we've, we've gone now, you know, technology. Unsurprisingly, few people purchased the device, but it marked a major breakthrough in the mobile technology. That's true, because again, first implementation of a, uh, of a, a of new technology, it's not, it, that's, th that technology will have a lot of flaws, and people will eventually learn from the flaws of that device, uh, which will make uh, or which will end up making better ones, way better ones. So yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, nowadays cell phones and smartphones uh, are also as indispensable gadgets in people's lives. I mean, I gotta be honest. I you know these phones, um, even though I can keep him for quite some time, I would tend to what kind of like change it in in a year or two. So I know it's not a good practice, but that's how, you know, generally uh, the consumers are now. So 
Alrighty guys, we're done for today. That is the end of our show today. Thank you so much for uh, joining me. I hope you like it. I hope you learned something new. Um, don't forget to leave your thoughts about, about the topics we discussed in the comment section below. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye for now.